Blessed, praised and hallowed be Jesus Christ on his throne of glory and in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Amen. It's lovely to be with you and to visit this church again. I was first here, I first crossed its threshold on the 10th of June 1993. I know that so precisely because it was the solemnity of Corpus Christi, it was a Thursday. And Father Maskell was the parish priest. And I came with my friend Sally. Sally was thinking about becoming a Catholic, and she had a pushchair, their first child, Sally and Francis Nichols, first child, George. And I'd just left the Church of England and ministry in the Church of England, having been a curate just down the road at St Martin's Brighton, the Lewis Road, that bit of Brighton that goes out to the east. It was a special sort of time for me, but a difficult time, as you can imagine. I'd stood in the pulpit of St Martin's, which is about as tall as the organ loft here, on the 6th of June, the Sunday, to announce my intention to leave the Church of England. And after that, I ceased functioning, and ceased as well drawing a stipend, and took off my clerical collar, and found some lay clothes and lived, uh, thanks to the generosity of the Anglican bishop, in the house I'd occupied as a serving clergyman uh, for a few weeks more. And I'm bound to say that I sort of decided I would give up as well the practice of the faith in that I didn't go to church because where should I go? So I had three days off, didn't stop praying, but didn't go to church. And on the Thursday, the solemnity of Corpus Christi, I thought, well, I'm now going to prepare in earnest to become a Catholic. I was received a little bit later on the 6th of August that year, but on Corpus Christi, I found myself going to church. And I came here. And the church was full at lunchtime with people who were engaged in celebrating the great solemnity, people who were catching mass on a holiday of obligation, perhaps having been at work just down the road. There wasn't a great deal of solemnity, not many servers, no incense, no music, but it felt very right and very special. So this church has a, a hugely important place in my affection and I'm delighted to be here. I want to focus really on communion and the gift of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And I want us to focus specifically on that phrase of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us? So let's listen to the Gospel now as the scene is set. Two of the disciples of Jesus were on their way to a village called Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking together about all that had happened. Now as they talked this over, Jesus himself came up and walked by their side, but something prevented them from recognising him. He said to them, what matters are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped short, their faces downcast. Then one of them, called Cleopas, answered him, You must be the only person staying in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have been happening there these last few days. What things? he asked. All about Jesus of Nazareth, they answered, who proved he was a great prophet by the things he said and did in the sight of God and of the whole people and how our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and had him crucified. Our own hope had been that he would be the one to set Israel free. And this is not all. Two whole days have gone by since it all happened, and some women from our group have astounded us. They went to the tomb in the early morning and when they did not find the body, they came back to tell us they had seen a vision of angels who declared he was alive. 
Some of our friends went to the tomb and found everything exactly as the women had reported, but of him they saw nothing. Then he said to them, You foolish men, so slow to believe the full message of the prophets, was it not ordained that the Christ should suffer and so enter into his glory? Then starting with Moses and going through all the prophets, he explained to them the passages throughout the scriptures that were about himself. When they drew near to the village to which they were going, he made as if to go on, but they pressed him to stay with them. It is nearly evening, they said, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And while he was with them at table, he took the bread and said the blessing. Then he broke it and handed it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he had vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us? as he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us. They set out that instant and returned to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven assembled together with their companions, who said to them, Yes, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then they told their story of what had happened on the road and how they had recognized him at the breaking of bread. We've probably heard the gospel several times during the Easter season, certainly in the ordinary form of the Mass during the Easter octave, and at other times, either in the liturgy or in our own private prayers. It's a good thing to ponder these resurrection appearances of the Lord. And that's why the Church gives them to us in the celebration of the sacred liturgy. For many, Luke's encounter of those disciples with the Lord is amongst the most favourite. If we think about St. Luke's Gospel, there are long bits of it which hold our attention. The prodigal son, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And perhaps this excerpt from St. Luke's Gospel also holds our attention. The narrative of an encounter with the Lord. A good story which in its telling loses none of its real and truthful impact. It's also a meeting of a community, a small gathering around a table where in the mystery of the Lord's giving of himself, in every aspect of that mystery, for when he gives himself, he holds nothing back, his risen life, is revealed to those two disciples. Let's ponder them for a moment. They're described as disciples, but they have not been of the twelve. They're followers of Jesus, part of that extended group who had attached themselves to the Lord and would learn from his teaching. We heard in the Gospel at Mass earlier today that many of the disciples questioning Jesus' teaching had said this is intolerable and as a reaction had left him. These disciples had remained faithful and their fidelity is to be rewarded. But everything about them has been, as it were, left behind in a haze of disappointment. So they set off for a reason we do not know and to a place the location of which is imprecise to a village called Emmaus or Emmaus 
or however you want to say it. Leaving Jerusalem, the place of promise and covenant, they are dejected and depressed. Not a bad thing to go on an Easter Monday for a good walk to let the head clear. And after the mystery of the Triduum days, these disciples are perhaps seeking consolation in the familiar things, the natural order of things, as they make their way to this village. And en route, our Lord joins them. As disciples, they would have walked with the Lord for miles. They would have known something of his gait, something of his position in the company. They would have seen him in a familiar sort of way. And this is a familiar context for them. It's not, as it were, something strange for them to have walked with the Lord. And yet, they do not recognise him. Some of you may know that, even though I'm a priest of this diocese, and will return here in June 2017, or perhaps a little bit later if I can eke out a last summer in Oxford, I am at the moment living and working in that great university city. Not in the university, but rather directing the Converts Aid Society, the St Barnabas Society, which has been based in Oxford for almost 30 years. It's a good place to be. It's the centre of the country. And because of our work with beneficiaries, convert clergymen and religious from the Church of England, convert clergy women as well, and a Jewish rabbi who's also a convert to Christianity and finds himself at the heart of the Catholic Church, because of those associations, Oxford is a very good place to be. The people who come our way have very different stories. They're very different sorts of people and they have very different backgrounds. One of the convert clergy women, Karen, is a former minister from the United Reformed Church. She found her way into the full communion of the Catholic Church by a spirit of deep, contemplative prayer and she attached herself to the Carmelite sisters at Quidnam and at Quidnam outside the enclosure living in a little hermitage which previously had been occupied by the great sister Wendy Beckett Karen is preparing this very week uh, to make her promises as a hermit Bishop Allen hopes the Bishop of East Anglia himself a convert clergyman will be in attendance to hear and receive Karen's promises. The journey for her has been an interesting one to say the least. And some people who misunderstand the work of the St Barnabas Society, the Converts Aid Society, say to me, but what is a convert clergywoman doing in the Catholic Church? The call to become a Catholic is one which is so deep that it cannot be ignored. Of course, Karen had no expectation of ministry in the Catholic Church, but her contribution to the life of the Catholic Church, having accepted in all its fullness, the fullness of Catholic faith, is to be part of its contemplative heart. What could be more beautiful than that call? And indeed the response to the call is absolutely fundamental for it cannot be ignored. Those two disciples are engaged after a while in the journey with the mysterious stranger in a path of contemplation. And in contemplation, the Lord 
even though they do not recognize him, opens for them the scriptures. They are disconsolate, and he gives them consolation. They are ignorant, and he teaches them the mystery that the Messiah had first to suffer and die to reach his glory. And then he is prepared to give them time. In the work of the society, perhaps the most valuable thing we do, next to praying for our beneficiaries, is simply to give them time. The charity, for it is a charity, is fortunate enough to have funds to support those who, leaving ministry in another Christian community, have lost identity and livelihood and a place to live. But perhaps the most important thing we do next to prayer and before that practical help is simply to give time and time and friendship. Because many who come our way will not, in the final analysis, enter the full communion of the Catholic Church. Many who come our way will simply ponder the questions and go away, I think, with a sort of heaviness and a sense perhaps of disconsolation and with their own questions and perhaps still searching for answers. But the time given is crucial. It's not that we're particularly generous people. It's rather that at the heart of our work is simply that call to spend time, to walk with people on what is sometimes a pretty rough and rugged journey. At the end of the journey to Emmaus, the Lord was prepared to give more time, more of himself, in ways which could not possibly have been imagined by those two disciples. Reaching Emmaus, he sat down with them. They had pressed him to stay. Such was their enthusiasm for his company. He made as if to go on. There's something perhaps a little mischievous about this. But they had pressed him to stay, and of course he did with the generosity of Almighty God himself. And at table, he revealed himself to them in that familiar way. He took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, and they knew it was the Lord. But he'd vanished from their sight leaving them changed, full of wonder, full of awe at the new and living sign of his presence. And notice that even though they were so tired at the end of that journey, anxious for shelter and sustenance, they do not stay no, they find new energy and they go back to Jerusalem for they have to to tell the eleven and the other disciples that they had seen the Lord. In the work of the St. Barnabas Society it's extraordinary the number of people who come with others having found some security in the faith and some company on the journey. People who come in, in pairs or perhaps in larger groups. Most significantly and most dramatically after the response of Pope Benedict 
in the setting up of the ordinariate of Our Lady of Walsingham in this country. They come in larger groups. But often through the society and families, I think of Jack and Sarah Lusted. I was ordained in the Church of England with Jack. Jack became a Catholic two years ago with Sarah, his wife, and their four children. If families are the domestic church, then the Lusteds in their journey into full communion with the Catholic Church were becoming just that. Yes, the company is important. And the company gives us confidence, it gives us a sense of certainty, it gives us encouragement, how important we are to each other and how important those disciples were to each other and to the others and to the eleven who were able to confirm the sign, particularly in the person of Peter. Yes, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. But during the Easter season, it seems profitable to ponder the resurrection appearances of our Lord. And perhaps for many of us, Emmaus is amongst the favoured. But all of them, all of those appearances, for they speak to all of us, engage us personally and profoundly. And they engage us particularly as well. Emmaus as it were, presents to us the church coming to birth. In the more personal encounter of Mary of Magdala and the Lord, when we hear Mary's name called, it's almost as if we can hear our own name called by the Lord. We rush with Peter and John to the tomb, we doubt with Thomas. And our senses are engaged too. We hear, we touch, we see, we taste, and we even smell those spices which the women brought to the tomb. Yes, the Easter Gospels of the resurrection of the Lord deepen our mystery of the risen Christ, our hope of glory as we allow him to touch our hearts. We felt the pain of the crucifixion and we have wept our tears. But now our tears are more profound. They are tears of joy. The priest was telling me the other day that at the twelfth station of the cross on Good Friday, he broke down. He's not a particularly emotional man, and he was rather embarrassed about it. An elderly nun in the congregation came out of her pew and put her arm around him, and he said he was sorry for being so silly. I think so many of us have felt that joy which may be manifest itself, manifest itself in tears, which does not leave us feeling silly, but rather leaves us feeling so strengthened and so certain and so filled with hope and so galvanized in charity that it is almost as if the risen Christ was touching our hearts and enabling us to do in his name the greatest things. We have become, as it were, in the mystery of these Easter days, like Peter, we have moved from, Lord, to whom can we go? To an utter confidence that the power of the Lord, the power of grace, has been working and is working through us. A heart which has been prepared, yes, by the grace of the sacrament of penance for these Easter days. 
but a heart which is now touched by the risen life of the Lord, so that at our every moment of turning to him, it is his love which we find, his life which is ours, and him whom we recognise. No, our, our faith in the risen Christ isn't a magic touch. Rather, it is the power which is at work in us, which equips us and prepares us so that the moment of revelation for us, our Emmaus moment, is a moment when we realise that we are loved and that nothing can take away that love that the burning heart might be ours. This is the grace of the journey. And this is the grace which on the journey, please God, will never leave us. Just as the two were hungry and thirsty and tired after their journey, so in the depths of their soul, they did not feel hunger or fatigue or thirst. They were completely satisfied by the Lord who holds nothing back when he gives us himself. Pope Emeritus Benedict, whose 89th birthday we celebrate today, said that Emmaus, as far as the archaeologists were concerned, and he understood, could not be identified. He said that this did not worry him, for it allows us to think that Emmaus is everywhere, and most especially before the altar, before the tabernacles of our churches. When our Lord comes to us and reveals himself to us, he holds nothing back and gives himself to us completely. And our hearts burn within us, for we have recognized him and his abiding love for us. Blessed, praised and hallowed be Jesus Christ on his throne of glory and in the most holy sacrament of the altar.